living in very challenging times right now, and it's affecting all of us. I mean, nobody thought we'd have to be looking at the possibility that there may not be a future for planet Earth to maintain life, you know, in the under the circumstances that we've created. And and uh, it's like, whoa, never been here before. This is serious, and this is uncomfortable, and and um, I feel a lot of sorrow and concern. You know, the Earth has a temperature range for life, and you can't go below that or you can't go above it and and the earth even though the sun has been heating up can, and will continue to heat up has always been able to maintain its own dynamic equilibrium within a temperature range that supports life And now it's on the edge of not being able to do that. And that's why we're having these storms and all that's going on. And I feel despair over our lack of understanding of that. A major part, I'd say, of my growing up was being born and raised and imprinted in Colorado because everything's about nature. There were these two magnificent, huge cottonwood trees, one in the front yard, one in the backyard. I love those cottonwood trees, the rustle of the leaves. And I'd go down in the basement, get my grandfather's old canvas army sleeping bag and sleep all summer long underneath the cottonwood tree. There was a certain amount of tension in my house, I think with my mother's alcoholism and her, you know, her numbing herself. I just wanted to be outside. So I used to kind of laugh at one point in my life and say, I'm really a cottonwood trying to figure out how to become a human being. <laughs> I actually enrolled at California Institute of Integral Studies in a master's program called Phil Philosophy, Cosmology, and Consciousness. And, oh, wow. If I ever said I had a spiritual awakening, we were doing this study on honeybees. And I just remember realizing, wow, the whole thing is interconnected, interrelated, interdependent, and it's so wise. I just had such reverence and let's pay attention to this and let it mentor us. In the early 80s, the Physicians for Social Responsibility was being asked to come up with contingency plans for what to do in the event of a nuclear war. People said, this is insane. We should be putting all of our emphasis into prevention and it became known as Beyond War. Einstein said, when we split the atom, everything changed, except for our way of thinking. So we need to look at what's wrong with our way of thinking and address that. We made bold statements. We said, with the splitting of the atom, now we have the capacity to end all life on this planet. 
war is obsolete. And we have to learn to resolve conflicts without using violence. Everything we're currently doing really needs to be set aside. There's a new urgency that we really need to focus on. We had four agreements that we were all trying to apply to our lives to see if we could validate them as individuals. And they were, I will resolve all my conflicts without using violence. The second one was, I will not preoccupy my energy with an enemy. It's so easy to be mad at somebody and blaming them. Is there anything I can really do about this? All right, if there is, stay with it and, and start creating a response, a remedial response. If not, let it be and re-guide your energy. The third one, I will maintain a spirit of goodwill. Doesn't mean I get up every day just, oh, and, you know, good shape and everything. Oh, this is really bothering me. Okay, take care of it. Like Gandhi, Martin Luther King, maintain a freedom in yourself to be able to respond to what's currently happening. And then the fourth one, I will work together with others in order to create a world that is beyond war. Oh, I have to work with him? Oh, no, 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 no. Well, the fact that he even bothers you, that there's something for you to learn from that. So, no, no, I'll work together with others, whoever they are. I'm validating these things in my own life. And that is powerful. I mean, we didn't ever think of ourselves sitting down negotiating treaties with world leaders. But I wouldn't be intimidated to do that. Because if I can get along with, mm -hmm, and do this, mm -hmm, yeah, I did. I, you bet I'll meet with you and say, you, we got to solve this. And no more blame. That's a useless. We gotta work of these differences out. Diversity is our strength. There were 40,000 people at one point by the end of the 80s that were involved in Beyond War. We get everybody in California awakened and thinking fresh and new about Beyond, about war and taking responsibility. Well, California already has a reputation of, oh yeah, California, you know. It's like, but we live here in the Midwest, or we live here in, the, you know, Minnesota or the Southeast or wherever. So we decided it, for this to actually be effective, we have to actually move to these places and, and work there. So we took our children and we moved to Georgia and people went to the Northeast the Midwest, Colorado, the Rocky Mountains, and our lives changed immensely. Our youngest son in elementary school, he had an experience of really true integration. People that's like, you're moving to Georgia and you're taking your sons and out of this wonderful school district, you're just doing your thing at the expense of your children. Well, maybe there's not going to be a big inheritance for our children. But what we are doing is we're working for their future. A friend of mine called and said, there are a number of people that are quite critical about what you're doing and feeling that it's not right to just uproot your children so you can do your thing. So we called Brian and we both said to them, um, 
you know, if this is if this is right in any way, then we need to address it and do something about it. And uh, he said, "Do you know how proud of of you and Dad I am? Absolutely not. And I love it here, and I'm thriving, and." But, you know, I mean, I just thought we had opportunities to work things through that that um, were just so beneficial. I had the opportunity when we were in Georgia working on Beyond War to go to the play, a play one time about the story of Martin Luther King's life. And sitting next to me was Martin Luther King Sr. He said, most people think when we talk about free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, I'm free at last, that we're talking about the society. No, we're all working to make the society better. But free means you are free and can be worked through. Martin Luther King shared vividly what it was like to be in a bad place and work yourself out of it. He'd sit at the kitchen table till two in the morning, having it out with God. I'm not doing this anymore. That's it. That's the final thing. I'm an introvert. I'm a scholar. And you're going to have to find somebody else. You know, I've done what I can do. And eventually he would always get himself to the place I see everything in my life has prepared me to do this work, and I will continue. And it was like, wow. Yeah. I feel a huge despair over what's going on in our world and how disconnected we are from the earth. But don't let the despair take you over. Say, all right, what can, where can I do and in, have influence? You know, with your grandchildren, or would bring things up, or, but give something that people can move forward with. Don't add to the people falling back on themselves in despair. What I said to my granddaughter is, I want you to know that you already belong. Because you are an expression of a 13.8 billion year process. And there's never been a you before. And there will never be a you again. You're a unique gift to this whole unfolding, flaring forth story of the universe. Yes, the world's changing. It's, this is a new emerging order. We're right in the middle of it and it requires a new human presence. Thomas Berry says, the question is not, what do I want the earth to be? The question is, what does earth want me to be? And stay focused on that. I grew up gardening. Both my mother and dad loved to garden, so I just started gardening here. And you know, how, the way children are, they're just curious and they're not inhibited that way. And, and uh, they'd come over and say, what are you doing? 
can I help? Can we pick some cherries from the cherry tree? And I just thought, I think I'm just gonna make this the neighborhood children's garden. And they feel a sense of pride, like they can do all that and they can take care of it. I want these young children to grow up knowing how precious this earth is. And I want them to know that they can feed themselves and they can plant things. And what a miracle, all these seeds, and then look at what they become. One of my very favorite people was Danilo Meadows, who went by Dana Meadows, who was a systems thinker early on. Limits to growth. We live on a street called Dana. So I named the garden the Dana Meadows Organic Children's Garden. And one of the little girls who was part of the garden had come by after school with her friend. And I hear this conversation going on. And the friend says, you mean you just get to come here whenever you want? And do it, do you, you don't even have to ask permission or ring the doorbell or anything. You just come and play with the bunnies and watch the ducks or eat cherries right off the tree. Well, yes, it's our garden, you know, kind of like. And her friend was like, whoa, that's amazing. And this is from Molly, who grew up here. I love this. I am from daisies and ducks nipping at my toes. I am from those honeybees across the street. They lived across the street from us. Never stung a living soul. I am from neighbors, watermelon, block parties galore. I can honestly say that I wouldn't have grown up to be the person I am today without the garden. The garden is a safe haven to me. It teaches young kids like me to appreciate mother nature and take a break from busy technology-filled lives. Throughout my many years at the garden, I have learned things I never would have learned at school. I have learned about the circle of life, the power of the great outdoors. I won't remember summer days spent inside watching television or doing homework, but I know I will always remember a loving community. Sincerely, Molly. Aldo Leopold said at the end of his life, we're doing some not doing well in our relationship with Earth. However, he said, it's been my experience that as people get to know the nature of the place where they live, they actually will care for it. We're not an inherently destructive species. Well, let's create a program by which we do that. Our program was named Exploring a Sense of Place. And it was a year long experiencing your bioregion in every season of the year. Here are the common themes, the deep time geologic story of the place where you live, the weather and climate patterns, the uh, indigenous wisdom, the people that have lived here for 4,000 years sustainably. Are we listening? Indigenous cultures that have never disconnected from the earth and had it be, become an object that they use for their own means have wisdom that we don't have. And we need to, that's the very wisdom we need to bring forward to the time we're living in and have it be a really strong value in our culture. Their organizing principle is balance. For capitalism, the organizing principle is progress, which entails growth 
expansion, extraction, and we're up against a huge imbalance. We're going to need seven, eight, nine planets because we're extracting so much. So what's wrong here? How did we end up being a culture that is using the planet but not actually caring for it? A group of younger people in their 20s learning how to be naturalists, working with this indigenous elder, were going to end their time together by doing a sweat lodge. And so the night before, this organizer said to the elder, is there anything I need? we need to prepare these young people for before they do the sweat lodge? The elder said, yeah, yeah, there is something that I think they should do. I think they should clean their cars. Did you say clean their cars? And he said, yes, and I'll tell you why. Their cars look terrible. They're dirty, they're full of trash. Even worse, they sort of pride themselves on not being materialistic. I don't care about that. I'm not one of these car guys. I'm not fussy about my car. I'm beyond that. But you know what I feel like is missing? Is respect. Everything in that car has been mined from the earth to make it. They should be actually thanking Mother Earth for that they have a means of transportation and respect that and show that respect for caring for the car, not just, oh. And I just thought, wow. I love this way of thinking. I'm calling a lot now on ancestor spirits, and I don't even know what that means. Like, here's just a little example. My grandfather was a judge, and my father was a lawyer. I loved it at the dinner table when they got into their conversations about democracy, and they cared so much about democracy. Well, we're living in a time right now that's challenging for democracy. And you better believe I'm talking to them a lot. Help, what do I do here? I need some guidance, yeah. I'll be quiet and listen, I'll, I'll go take a walk right now, listening. I sure would love some new thoughts about this or just whatever comes to me. I think that's how this works. You know, it's not like I got this all mastered or anything. This is what I would say that I learned from Martin Luther King. It's like, he, he would actually move himself to saying, I forgive that, that that's happening. It has to play itself out, so let it play itself. And, you know, don't, don't be in a state where you're just saying, that should not be happening. Well, it is. It's not like, oh, everything's just falling apart. Lots of things are falling apart that need to fall apart because they really aren't viable. This is where I go to people like the Michael Meads. We all came with gifts to give. And the universe, Brian Swim, Thomas Berry, the universe story reveals the universe works through energy. So what energizes your, you? And stay with that and just give. That's, that's your guideline. And, and take creative initiative to remedy the situation. You know, if it's a letter you're writing or adapt it so that you can address it in your own locale. 
and but just do something to remediate the situation. It's one earth and you know, we're part of this earth and, and we all belong. We all belong right here. And we, every one of us, and not just us as humans, but all the species, plant and animal. And, and we, we all have gifts to give. I mean, Michael Mead says it beautifully. You know, we all come with gifts, the gifts that the world desperately needs. <laughs>